Hello, everyone, and welcome to On Trial, the podcast where we explore how to build your practice, trial tactics, and what can make or break your case. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Heimlich. And I'm John Risvold. And today, our, our guest today is Jordan Powell uh, of Passion and Powell in Chicago. And uh, I got to interview him and go through the logistics of what was, I believe, one of, if not the first civil jury trial in DuPage County since the pandemic began. Yeah, and, you know, it super takes interesting. A, it really it was super interesting just learning the ins and outs of the logistics, how the judges are, you know, making this work. It seems like they had a really well thought out plan, you know, to actually execute this trial and, and make it happen in spite of, you know, the obvious limitations. It's great to see trials back. I'm very excited. Uh, you know, a good portion of my practice, as you know, is in DuPage County. And I had a pretrial uh, during this trial. And it was nice because the judge in my pretrial conference was using the fact that this trial was going on as leverage to push the defendant to try to settle. And we ended up settling my case that I didn't think was going to simply because this was going on. It's really interesting to hear Jordan's perspective, really interesting to hear how they conducted the trial, the logistics of all of it, how it went down. And, you know, some of the things that he did differently, but also some of the things that he said he did almost the exact same. It's just that, the way that the pandemic has changed our courtrooms and changed the way that we have juries and jurors has made uh, everything much, much more difficult, it sounded like. Yeah, it, it takes a brave lawyer and a brave client uh, to be one of, if not the first, uh, to try a case in this environment. And, you know, good for him, you know, for holding, you know, the the other driver and the insurance company accountable for what happened to his client. You know, good for his client for, you know, pushing for trial. You know, out, not always an easy thing. Trials, especially on our side, are nothing our clients ever want to go through. It's usually not a pleasant process for anybody. But, you know, good on her for pushing and, you know, good on Jordan for, you know, doing the work. And, you know, that's this is the reason why we all do this is to ultimately, you know, get justice for our clients in whatever form is available. And, you know, he, he got to he tried a case to, to verdict, you know, in, in this in this environment, which is a tremendous result. Yeah, it's great. It's it's great to see a client have that much trust in their lawyer, especially. I think if you're going to try a case, you really have to have a great relationship with your client and the client has to trust you fully because this is their only shot. This is their only case. We're going to try other cases and you might win, you might lose and losing is horrible. And I like, you know, I hate losing more than I like winning, but you know, this is their only shot. So to have a client that trusted him this much to say, okay, we're going to be the first trial and I need to get to trial or I want to get to trial fast instead of well, let's slow play it and see what happens and let somebody else test the waters. It really does take a, a pair of brave people, you know, a brave client and a brave lawyer. So very impressive. And it was nice to hear that the clients or not the clients, the problems remain the same. You know, we have COVID, but the problems with our cases remain the same as they always have been. You know, you have uh, jurors who are skeptical of non-economic damages. You have jurors who are skeptical of people who seem okay physically at a trial, you know, and those are difficult things for anybody to overcome under any circumstances. Um, but it's, it's good to hear from Jordan that, you know, at least these are things that we know, you know, so, and these are things that we can plan for and try to deal with as best we can. And that the, the whole COVID aspect it didn't seem like in his mind played a huge role in, you know, the, how the case was presented uh, and how the case was decided. I, I think from my conversation, one of the big takeaways is what kind of a jury pool are you going to get? You know, I think then that's an open question and obviously it's going to be a day by day and case by case basis. But I, I think between, you know, the, the age restriction and people just saying, you know, I have COVID concerns and, you know, understandably and correctly being allowed to get out of their service because of that, you know, it's going to leave you with a, a very different jury pool. Yeah, absolutely. And you're already in a jurisdiction where uh, the majority of the verdicts that come down in DuPage County are those that are very stingy when it comes to the actual human damages. The jury pool out here is quick to give bills and slow to award any compensation for non-economic damages. And that's only going to be sort of exacerbated when you get a jury pool that getting off for hardship is much easier. And to your point, rightfully so. If you have concerns about the pandemic and you are concerned in any way, shape or form, you shouldn't have to sit and serve on a jury uh, 
um, and put yourself in any sort of, you know, risk. But my experience trying cases has been that, you know, I've seen judges force people to come to jury selection and their hardship was, I don't have a car. I don't have a way to get here. Or I'm the sole caretaker for my mother or father. And if I'm not there, no one can care for them. Well, don't you have somebody who could come in? You know, getting off for hardship was actually difficult. And I think the concern I have hearing him discuss the way that they were letting people off of jury selection or off of the veneer by just saying they had a concern means that you don't really have to do anything to get out of jury select or, you know, jury duty anymore. And then you might end up with a pool of people who are there because they have an agenda or they're there because they're going to favor one side over the other. And if you don't have impartial juries, if you don't have people that can balance and weigh all the evidence and look at it impartially, then you don't have a system that works. And so that's my only concern with what they're doing in DuPage. But to your point, I think it's fair and the right thing to do for the time being. Yeah, it is a concern and I share those concerns completely. Uh, but the question becomes then what's the alternative? And, and there really doesn't seem to be one at this time. And, and, and let's give credit to the the whole administration over at DuPage County. Uh, those of us who practice in Chicago and the surrounding areas know that DuPage is probably the most functional of the Chicago and Collar yeah. County courthouses. No doubt. Um, everything there runs well. Uh, they're very well organized. Uh, the building is you know, technologically up to date, uh, which is rare. Um, and I, I, it does sound like they, they, they made a plan. It was well thought out and they executed it. And it sounds like they're going to continue to try these cases, which is obviously important for us to, you know, hold people accountable is, you know, the threat of trial or trial itself. Yeah. I, I echo that. I have said for a long time that the legal industry, especially in Chicago, uh, at the daily center is, like 50 years behind modern times. And DuPage County is as modern and up-to-date and um, you know put together as any place you can imagine or want. They've got a great judiciary and great leadership, great courthouse, courtrooms. It's just, it's running full steam on all cylinders and it's, it's really, really great to see. All right, and with that, we're gonna get to our interview with Jordan Powell. Today, we're excited to be joined by Jordan Powell. Jordan's a partner at Passon and Powell in Chicago, where he represents injured victims and their families in motor vehicle accident, medical malpractice, nursing home neglect, and other personal injury cases. Jordan has received several honors for his work, including inclusion in the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin and National Trial Lawyers Top 40 Under 40 lists. He's achieved several multi-million dollar settlements and verdicts including a $24.6 million settlement for a family injured in a truck crash in February this year. Jordan also recently tried the first civil jury trial held in DuPage County since the pandemic begins. So we're really excited to talk to him about that. Jordan, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me, Matt. Happy to be here. Yeah, before we uh, get into the trial itself, tell us a little bit about your case and your client. Yeah, so my case was a relatively, or what I thought to be a relatively simple auto case involving a rear-end collision that occurred in Hinsdale um, back in 2017. And uh, the injuries claimed were injuries, neck strains, upper back strains, but the, the primary injury was uh, a slap tear, or superior labral anterior to posterior tear in the, in the shoulder, the right shoulder. Um, and in terms of the witnesses that testified for us, um, our client, who's in her, she's about 52 now. She was 49 when the, the accident happened. Um, she testified. Her son, who was a passenger in the vehicle, testified. Um, her husband testified. The defendant testified. And then as uh, by way of video evidence depositions, we called two treaters. Um, her treating primary care doctor, who had been her treating doctor for 12, 13 years as well as the orthopedic surgeon that ultimately did the uh, shoulder repair um, testified as well. Okay. So, you know, you, you got this case and obviously, you know, it's been going along, you're getting ready for trial and then the pandemic hits and then everything yeah. gets delayed. Uh, when did you know that you're gonna be the first civil jury trial and what was your reaction? So the way this case played out is we were able to, like I said, it was a 2017 accident we had the case, um, 
I would say fully discovered in early, right before the pandemic hit. Okay, so right before the pandemic hit, we had the plaintiff's case fully discovered, all depositions of the treaters as well as um, the fact witnesses were done. The only thing that was up in the air at that point was one, whether the treaters were gonna testify live or evidence depositions, which was something that would have been considered irrespective of the pandemic. And then the defense was contemplating uh, hiring an F2. I apologize, hiring an F3 uh, expert witness, which they ultimately did. So the only discovery that occurred during the, the pandemic was their the deposition, their disclosure and deposition of their, their expert witness. And I want to say maybe at around July is when we ended up getting the trial date, July of last year. So right when Lake County reopened to Zoom hearings, um, we were in front of Judge Rome, who was phenomenal, by the way, for the trial. Um, he did a great job managing all the, the nuances that I'm sure we're going to discuss. But so July of last year, we got the trial date. I said, this case is going to be fully discovered within the next two months once I take the expert's deposition, give us the first trial date. And he did. He gave us an April um, trial date. About, ooh, I would say January of this year, Judge Rome's clerk gets, uh, sends an email to, uh, to both me and opposing counsel saying Judge, Judge Rome would like to hop on a, a Zoom call re regarding your upcoming trial date. And I had no idea what this was about. I said, sure, uh, let's set it up. And we you know, talked within the hour. And essentially what he said in that trial, uh, prepped, so to speak, uh, Zoom call, he says, Judge Pope Joyce giving us the directive to get trials going come April. In any cases that are set for trial, they're going to go. With that said, since your case is a new case, you're number five on the list. Okay. There's four cases that are ahead of yours given their age. So my directive to you is make sure you're ready for trial come April 9th. Okay, which was our final pretrial conference. Make sure you're ready, but I can't guarantee it's gonna go to trial starting the following Monday. Mm -hmm. So he says, closer in time, we may have a good handle on what's going on with those other cases, whether a lot of them are gonna get dismissed by way of settlement or voluntary dismissals, um, but trial continuances aren't gonna be granted according to the director from the chief judge. So we, in the weeks coming up for our final pretrial conference um, on the 9th, we were able, unable to get any answers. <laughs> so we're preparing the case as if it's going to go to trial. We get there on the 9th and Judge Rome says, yep, we're going to trial Monday. We're picking a jury Monday. So it was uncertain. We prepared as if it was going to go. I, I did evidence depositions of, of my two treaters. They did an evidence step of their expert all because we just wanted to secure that testimony and be able to play it in the event, you know, the trial had to get kicked. Yeah, DuPage had an interesting system there where, yeah, they, they ranked the cases. I didn't know they went all the way to five. Uh, I, I had one that was a two or a three, and I didn't realize that they were doing that. That's that's a lot of uncertainty, and it's, I mean, it yeah. sounds like you, you did the work and you were fully prepared, which is, uh, you know, speaks to, you know, what kind of lawyer you are and getting things done and making sure that, you know, there are no uh, stones left unturned or anything else left to do. So let's, um, so once you found out and, you know, that this was a possibility that having, you know, a, a trial during all this, what, what was the conversation with your client? Like, what, what were her thoughts on this? If I had a client that was ambivalent about it or concerned about the pandemic and COVID, affecting it, I probably wouldn't have taken an aggressive approach and probably would have hoped the case got kicked. But my client was like, you know, this has been going on for several years already. Let's do it and, and see how it plays out. I want this over with basically is, was her mentality. And, and 
there's so much uncertainty even now as to what, if any, impact COVID has on, on jury trial outcomes. And this one was uh, fortunately a relatively low risk type trial. Um, it wasn't gonna last a very long time. It only lasted four trial days, three jury days. So it wasn't gonna be something that was drawn out. It wasn't gonna be something where there was you know, several millions of dollars at stake where it was okay to take this chance. And I, and I had a client that wanted to take the chance. Um, before I took the aggressive approach of getting a trial date, the, uh, you know, I spoke with my client and, and she says, yes, let's get this trial date as soon as possible. Let's, let's, um, let's get it done with. I mean, part of her motivation was being perturbed through the whole process of multiple policy uh, demands and, and dealing with the insurance on the other side that not only wasn't willing to accept, you know, fault for, for the accident, but was willing to accept fault for the, the severity of, of the injury. So she kind of was almost fed up with their games and said, let's do it. That's great. It's great to have a client that's on board with you hundred percent. So you told a little bit, I told us a little bit about what you did to prepare. Uh, was anything different in the way that you prepared for this trial versus other trials in the past? No, I would say the preparation was exactly the same. Um, the only caveat to that would maybe be uh, whether or not to call the treaters live. Um, looking back at it, um, I don't think it mattered. I, I think both, uh, it would have been expensive to have the treaters come live. Um, and I think I probably still would have done it by way of evidence step. Um, but knowing that there was kind of this uncertainty about whether it was actually going to start on the 12th. Uh, I, that kind of lend, lend my, you know, decision towards just doing the evidence steps in the event the trial got kicked, I've got the testimony secured. Yeah. Calling treaters is tough live anyway, because with scheduling issues and everything else. And I think people are so used to watching videos and seeing you know, testimony, watching, you know, TV shows with courtroom issues on TV. I think they're all just kind of used to it. And I don't think it's a huge advantage or disadvantage, you know, to be, to call them, you know, just put a, put it on the video. And a lot of times it moves faster anyway. And I think the faster you can move it towards, you know, towards the verdict, I think you're doing a good service for your clients. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, th I think so too. I, I try to do it when, you know, when I think a treater will present well um, by evidence staff and when there aren't many issues that require a lot of rulings. And it's obviously much less costly to do it that way. So, so you get, you have your trial date. What are the logistics like in the courtroom? How are they uh, doing jury selection? I mean, I, I can't wait to hear this. So I'm, I'm very curious about all this. So uh, Jury selection, jury selection was hard very hard. Jury selection was the one thing that I think was impacted the most. The way it worked was um, 30 jurors came up. Okay. So let me back up. This is all based on what I was told. Um, we don't have, you know, no verification of this, but we were the only, at least when we did our trial, it was one trial per per day, meaning they were starting one trial, sorry, one trial per floor. So we were the only trial going in the building at the time. So anybody that came, started on a Monday and any jurors that were summoned um, appeared in the jury collection room. And out of that jury collection room, anybody over the age of 65 or anybody with a COVID concern, broadly uh, in quotes, COVID concern, we're let go. So if somebody was over the age of 65, we're let go if they wanted to be. So if somebody was over the age of 65 or said, I, I'm concerned about COVID or I've been exposed to COVID or uh, anything related to COVID, they were automatically let go. So we've already got a pre-screening that happens even before jurors come up to the courtroom. Then they send 30 jurors up and the courtroom is modified. It's the biggest courtroom on the, the second floor. It was courtroom 2018. 
the courtroom's modified to uh, fit 12 jurors in a box. Each, each chair is six feet apart. Okay. So that only leaves uh, in the gallery eight chairs, also six feet apart. So in the for jury selection, we had 20 jurors in the courtroom, 12 in the box, eight in the gallery. And then we had another 10 in a separate courtroom watching through closed circuit TV. So um, that in and of itself, I don't think was a hurdle to what was going on. The hurdle is not everyone would remove masks during jury selection, nor would the judge ask them to. Do. So think about how hard that is to get a, a, an accurate read on a person if all you can see are their eyes. So it was very difficult. It was very difficult. And that, that continued throughout the trial, getting a read on jurors. Did that change the way that you conducted your jury selection? Did you ask different questions or was your approach kind of the same? My approach was the same. I asked questions the same. Um, because the attorneys agreed, Judge Rome said that when we're behind the podium, we could take down our mask. Okay. The podium had plexiglass around it. The witness box had plexiglass around it. Judge Rome had plexiglass around him. The clerk had plexiglass around her. There was not plexiglass between uh, any of the jurors, but again, their, their chairs were six feet apart. So we were able to take our masks down anytime we were uh, behind the podium. But when we were going to or from the podium or approaching a witness, we had to have our masks on. Um, some jurors would follow and, and do, take their mask down when they were answering questions. I would say half did, but half didn't. And Judge Rome was never gonna say, please take down your mask, nor was he gonna permit us to say, please take down your mask. So no, I, but in terms of the, the style and the way I did it, um, I would say it was the same as is a, a normal procedure in terms of voir dire, but uh, figuring out truly are these people, jurors that I'm going to like was very difficult. As far as the jurors that you know showed up and were allowed in the courtroom after going through those screening processes, like you said, you know, what, what was the makeup like? What, what, what kind of jurors were you uh, picking among? Yeah, so this was actually my first trial in DuPage. So I, I can't compare it to other uh, DuPage veneers. Very different than Cook, even very different than McHenry or Lake. Um, it was, uh, of the 30, there was not one African-American. There was maybe four or five ethnic, even a combination of um, either Indian or Asian, and the rest were Caucasian. So um, overall, I would say they were a very sophisticated group. We had a lot of, we had actually ended up having a nurse on our jury, but we had a lot of well-educated, we had a lot of, um, people in like the job search industry, uh, people that actually, no lawyers, but people that worked for law firms, um, no physicians, but um, they seem to be a more sophisticated group. Okay. Any, um, with the age issue, you know, with people who are over 65, you know, being, having that out, uh, did you have any people who in that age group who stayed or was it everyone was younger than that? Everyone was younger, which would have been tough if my client was an older lady. Um, I would have thought, you know, if my client was older, I would have been very concerned about not her, her not getting a full representation of her peers. Um, but, but given that my client was 52 at the time of the trial, I felt it was relatively a good sample for her. Um, I think unrelated to COVID or anything else, for whatever reason, there weren't many women in the group, but uh, we ended up getting 
five women on our jury. So it ended up being fine. So what, once the trial begins, you know, Art, what are you doing um, as far as trying to connect with the jury, you know, during opening statement, you know, with the mask on, you know, how, how are you trying to reach them, you know, with that, with that barrier between you guys? Very hard, very, very hard, especially with the directive to stay as much behind the podium as possible um, because we've got the podium centered in the middle of the room. And the reason for staying behind it is there's no, can't get close to the jury because there's no plexiglass. Not that you would necessarily want to get too close anyways, but um, you're pretty much stuck behind the podium, but you get no feedback. You get no feedback from what you're saying. And that's, that's the real, I think, you know, that was the real hard part um, in both selection as well as through the trial is you're looking at 12 masks. Yeah. And, you know, it, it really um, affected my ability to see how things were going. <laughs> did uh, that, that whole aspect of it, did that lead you to make any changes as far as presentation? Like, for example, relying on more uh, visual, you know, uh, aids during uh, the trial than you would have otherwise used had you had the opportunity for more, you know, uh, person person to person connection with the jurors we did um use a, a number of visual aids um but i don't think those were in any way different than what i would have done in a normal circumstance of trial um the visual aids were necessary in my opinion to to help explain the injury and um and i i don't think they were any different because of covid as far as the, um, as far as the trial itself, the mechanics. Mm -hmm. let, let's talk a little bit about that. Like from day to day, how are, what what what's going on? How are things? Uh, how are they making things move along and trying to keep people safe and 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 secure within uh, the courtroom? So witnesses were instructed and required to take off their masks while they were testifying. So remember, they're behind plexiglass. And there's a microphone um, with them as well. There was a microphone at the podium as well. Because you remember, I mean, these a, a jury box of 12 jurors is one thing. A jury box of 12 jurors six feet apart is a whole nother thing. I mean, you literally have to turn your head fully left to right to eye all jurors if you're talking to them. So juror number 12 is very, very far from the witness stand. Um, so the microphones were integral for that. Um, I think it was more just to make people feel comfortable, but anytime this was through jury selection, through questioning of witnesses, when witnesses changed, you know, seats, when a, a, another attorney went up to the podium and another attorney got down, the, the sheriff would wipe everything down with, uh, Lysol wipes. So you had to remember kind of a couple things to do that. Something you forget sometimes, you know? That he wanted to do that but um that was something that was done and passing exhibits directly to witnesses um that wasn't being done they would have to go and you know pass it to the judge and the judge passes it to the witness but overall i think judge rome did a great job navigating that i think once the trial began it was pretty smooth so once the trial began the only issues that i foresaw we're just getting a read on the jury through, you know, during opening and closings. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I, it's tough to know for sure, but um, jury selection, I think was the most impacted. The other thing that I think may be important to bring up is um, jur the jury when they, during breaks, and then uh, lunch and when they would collect in the morning again this was only a three days of jury so it didn't really make a huge deal but they were not together okay the jurors were uh, because they didn't have a jury room other than for deliberations which was on a different floor 
they didn't have a jury room that accommodated 12 people safely. So the jury was split six in one jury room and six in another jury room during breaks. Now, what if any impact that had? It probably shouldn't have had any, um, but it was just kind of something that was new and different. Sure. No, that <laughs> this is all very different. We're, yeah. Well, we're and, and, and Judge Ro- <laughs> yeah, and Judge Rome asked us, he said, this is this is what we're doing with the juries to keep them safe. We can't accommodate 12 in one jury room. We're going to split them. Do you want us to to split them the same each day or mix it up? And 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 I said, mix them up, you know, get the jurors getting to know one another, you know, a little more rather than being, you know, a group of six and then another group of six. So I don't know. I don't know what, if anything, that difference that made, but um, again, it's behind closed doors, but it was something that was quite different than what you normally see. Yeah. This may be a difficult question uh, to ask or for you to know, but did you notice any difference in the engagement level of the jurors, um, you know, with this trial versus other cases you've had uh, anything observable to you on that end? Very good question. Really hard to say because you can't really get a gauge on what they're doing. I mean, they were pretty active in taking notes. They deliberated for about maybe about two and a half hours, which I would say would be a fair deliberation for this type of case. Um, We didn't do jury questions. So I don't know in terms of engagement there. I mean, they were attentive the whole time in terms of what I could observe. They were watching the whole time through the evidence steps. They were watching witnesses. Um, We didn't have jurors falling asleep. They were um, uh, on time every day. Um, I think they were attentive. I think they were there and and jurors that I spoke with after the fact, they seem like they they were receptive to the whole process and got it. Um, the attorneys never mentioned COVID. We didn't mention it during during uh, the trial. We didn't mention it during jury selection. Um, the judge at the very beginning, when they all came in, mentioned it, saying, "You know, we're taking all the precautions. We're here because the courts are back open, um, and we're required to be here." Um, which was a concern of mine, our jurors going to hold it against us, against me or the plaintiff or anybody for, for making them be here. So um, we addressed that at the beginning before we even got a jury. And Judge Rome indicated that he would talk to them about it and say, you know, if anybody feels you've already been screened for COVID and you've already been screened for, for things that you're concerned about related to COVID, but if any of you have any issues or you're, un, uh, you're concerned or you feel unsafe, let my bailiff or me know, and and we'll take it. We'll take care of it. Um, so I don't think it. Be, I, I don't think it was an issue for the jury. I really don't. Yeah, that's that. that what you touched on is one of my major concerns about cases. You know, going forward, um, is that they're going to put it on us. Uh, yeah. you, you're the reason why we're here. You're bringing right. this lawsuit. You, you're put, you're right. making me do this. And you know, that's not, it, it may not bode well for us and our clients. So I, I, I'm glad to hear the judge was taking the lead on that. Well, I and, asked him about it because I said, if you're not going to say something about it, then I'm going to need to vadir on it. I'm going to need to ask something along the lines of, you know, the, you obviously are here because the courts have reopened and we're obviously in the middle of a pandemic, you know, we'd be able to put that aside and not hold it against my client for having to be here. And, you know, I was going to have to get into questions like that. And obviously we didn't want jury selection or the judge rightfully so didn't want jury selection to be about COVID. Um, So he right off the bat kind of took care of that himself. And I'd like to think that it didn't affect the outcome. No, I think that's a perfect way for the judge to take that off the parties and and, totally. make, and I, I think that was a, a great and judge rome's a great guy i've been in front of him a bunch of times and so i'm yeah i'm not, totally. I'm not surprised was, but i'm glad that to hear that that's uh what he in fact chose to do and i'm yeah, sure i'm sure it, it i'm sure it did he took it he took it completely off the 
parties. And, and that way, nobody was resentful for having to be there in the midst of what else is going on. You mentioned a little bit earlier that you got to talk a little bit with the jury afterwards. Uh, tell sure. us about that. We didn't think COVID didn't come up once um, in the discussions after the pandemic. It was more just literally what I would ask of any juror, you know, how'd you guys come to your decision? Why'd you do what you did? Anything you think I could do better? What witnesses did you like? Didn't what witnesses didn't you like? Um, and you got the, the same answers that you, you, you would expect otherwise. Um, you know, it was, I, I don't think there weren't many jurors that were willing to talk. Um, but that could have just been, you know, it was the end of the day after a trial and they wanted to get home. I don't know if that had any impact related to COVID or if COVID had any impact on that at all. But, um, yeah, I, I don't think the process, um, of, for, you have to remember, jurors don't go through this on a daily basis. You know, they don't, this is for most of them is one, their one and only experience in a courtroom and seeing a jury trial. So to them, this is, you know, obviously we're wearing masks, that's not normal and certain things are not normal, but to them, it was normal. So, um, you know, to them from a trial perspective, it was, you know, what they would expect unless they had been through it before. To yeah. us, it's totally different. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I, I guess I've never thought of it from that perspective that, you know, we're, you know, we're in court all the time. And this is, yeah, like you said, this is their one and only. So they, they have no context. Right. So they, they, unless they've sat through a trial before, they don't know that oftentimes witnesses appear live. They don't know that jurors are, uh, I'm sorry, that attorneys, you know, use the well of the courtroom more. To them, the difference is, yeah, the chairs are far apart, people are wiping things down, and everyone's wearing masks. And, and in terms of how a trial normally would go or how a jury selection normally would go, they don't know otherwise. I think you mentioned earlier that the jurors, <clears throat> once, once everyone rested and the case was uh, to the jury, they, they went to an entirely different floor to deliberate. They went up to the third floor because there was, uh, I guess that was the only room, and I'm not sure if it was a total jury room or just a secured courtroom, but that's where they did the deliberations. My understanding, it was a jury room, um, I believe, and that's, that's the only room that could fit all 12. So that's where they did their deliberations. They told us when a verdict was in, we all came back, and then the the bailiff for the sheriff went to go get them from that room, brought them down, and that was it. And I know uh, you, you told me before we got on that there's some post-trial issues going, but I, I, I think it's fair to say that, or I'm, I'm okay to say that it was a plaintiff's verdict for your client? Yeah, yeah, it was a plaintiff's verdict. Um, there, are, there is, is post-trial going on. Um, it wasn't, um, in all fairness, the verdict that I had hoped for. And whether COVID had anything to do with that, um, I don't know. I, I can't say. I can't say if I tried the case in a different COVID world or even in a COVID world with just a different jury, it would be a different outcome. Um, I can't say. I mean, I think one of the things that may have hurt in my case, as I mentioned, it was a, a rear end collision case and vehicle photographs became part of the trial and were allowed to be seen by the jury. And I think that may have hurt me to some extent um, in terms of the, the award of damages and the severity of the damages. Um, but that could have happened in a non-COVID world too, just the same. So I, I don't know that COVID had anything to do with the outcome. Other than potentially not getting your full pool of jurors and having difficulty during jury selection. And that I'll never know. Right. And, and that's, that's going to be a very interesting thing going forward about who actually makes it up, you know, to I jury know. selection. And it's, it's hard to know what the other potential jurors might've looked like may have, what have might've been like, but it sounds like you're dealing with the, your classic, you know, auto defense 
issues. You know, they're putting up the photos, they're hiring an expert. Um, and tell us a little bit about, about that dynamic. You know, you, you have your treaters on the stand testifying, you know, that everything's related, that the accident caused or aggravated these injuries. And then they have, was it just one expert or did they have a biomechanical had, or anything? No, just no the biomechanical. They just had one doctor who was allowed to testify because he had some biomechanic training allowed to testify the mechanism of injury. Um, and his whole position was that the way her shoulder, way her arm was positioned in the car at the time of the impact was not a, a competent mechanism of injury to cause the type of tear she sustained. So this had to be something degenerative that had occurred over time. Um, I thought two treaters, including the surgeon, any days better over uh, an expert and to tie up everything. Um, maybe I took it for granted because the jury didn't tie up everything. They tied up some of it, but not everything. Um, and that's where I think the photographs may have played a role. That's tangible evidence that the jury could, you know, at least jurors that didn't want to award as much as we were looking for, um, were able to hang their hat on is these photographs that showed relatively minor damage. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a relatively recent uh, case that's allowed defendants to put those into evidence under basically any circumstance. Uh, it's a really well, really, thing. you're right. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's the Peach case. I think it's called Peach versus McGovern. The case that that it overturned. Well, this was a Supreme Court decision, but the case before that was Dika Solo. That didn't usually allow photographs in unless there was expert testimony connecting the damage or lack of damage to the injury. But now if credibility is an issue, so our client, my client, as well as her son saying this was big, heavy impact, despite what the damage shows, it felt heavy on the inside and defendant testified this was minor impact. It was just a tap at three, four miles per hour. That's a credibility determination. The court and Peach says, well, photographs can be relevant to determine to help weigh credibility. So you don't need to necessarily have an expert that says, that says, um, you know, he used the photographs in making his determination one way or another, whether the injuries are related. I don't agree with the decision. I don't think it's proper. And I think it can cause things to happen um, that, that, that aren't warranted because you look at photographs and without getting into the details of what happens in a car accident and the biomechanic engineering behind it, how all the forces are transferred to the occupants and how bumpers are meant to withstand damage. Um, but the occupant ultimately suffers without getting you know, into all that and having experts testify to all that, I think the jury's misled with minor damage photographs. I couldn't agree more. Um, and then the, the other issue, which, which is fascinating that the jury, you know, isn't relating everything in the face of, you know, uh, especially considering one of your treaters is a very prominent surgeon in Chicago. He's a, he's a big name. Um, he's someone who people seek out and travel. I, I know personally of people who have traveled from out of state uh, to get operated on by him because he's, he's that good you know, unimpeachable, uh, cred, you know, credentials and credibility. And that's still, still not enough. Once you get the, the photograph, uh, it gives them a permission structure, you know, to yeah. kind of let them off the hook. It's, it's, it's an unbelievable thing. Yeah, totally. I don't, I don't think I could have picked a better treater, um, for, for a shoulder type injury. And, and still the jury wasn't willing to connect it all. Um, yeah, the photographs, I think, is, is probably what hurt me the most in the case. I would say even more than potential juries, uh, jury selection or jurors that I missed out on. Well, it's good to know that the problems are, are, are all the same, that they're not new ones <laughs> <laughs> that, that we have to deal with. It's always you know, the same ones. I would say so. I mean, I would I would say the landmines, at least in a small auto case, like we're talking, you know, small three, four day trial. I would say the landmines are still the same. Um, 
with the one added landmine of jury selection, which is a big one. Um, I would do it again for a similar type case. I would not do it for a case that had complex issues or was going to be like a complex medical case. Uh, I just think it's, it's the process isn't seamless yet. I think jury selection is, is too difficult for a more complex case. I really do. Yeah. Any, you know, looking back on it now, uh, in the jury selection process, anything that you would have done differently or anything you would have, you would have changed or added? I think I would have maybe, you know, it's, it sounds selfish, but it's for my client's best interest. I would have asked the judge to force the jurors during selection to take their mask down. I think that um, that was difficult. Now, whether it really impacted anything, I don't know. I have no way of knowing that. But if you think about how diff on a day to day basis now, when we're trying to communicate with someone, you can't even get a smile behind a mask or maybe face shields. You know, maybe face shields where you can actually see their expression um, would have been something that I would have insisted on. I think that was it was difficult. That's yeah, the hard one. Enough. Yeah, that's the one thing. I, I don't regret trying the case by any means. I think um, it was a good experience. It was a good learning experience in this in this pandemic, and we got to get them going again somehow, some way. Right. I mean, rumor has it that we're going to be starting trials again in Chicago uh in the very near future good luck yeah I, that's the rumor uh we'll and, see. and that's where i practice mostly <laughs> and i just don't see the logistics working out i mean it, it, it took a lot of manpower it took a lot of um thought in a two in a th sorry it was a, a three-story building in dupage but really the jurors came in on the first floor took the escalator up to the second floor and then they're at the jury you know they're at our room in the Daly Center or even in some of the Collar counties, it's a whole different disaster. And this was a relatively unpacked courthouse altogether. The majority of the people, you know, that were there were related in some way to the trial. So it's already a fairly empty courthouse. Um, and they were able to do it. I, I think they did a great job with it in DuPage. I think the, the courtroom was well equipped, but I just don't see that type of efficiency happening in in cook county yet with the elevators and and everything and in the the volume in cook county it's going to be it's going to be uh, an interesting experience yeah i i can't even imagine how it would actually work uh dupage is very very well run uh the yeah. courthouse it, from top to bottom everything works it is relatively uh open and there is a decent amount of space for everybody within the courtroom and elsewhere uh the daily center is not like that at all so yeah i, I couldn't I, agree i couldn't agree more with dupage it's very well run one thing i was kind of surprised about is i expected to uh, them to take temperatures when you went through security they didn't so it you know because we are all hopefully going to be back to trying cases on a regular basis soon enough. Uh, any advice for people who are going to be trying cases, anything, you know, that you think might be useful uh, because of these particular circumstances that you learned because of this experience? Yeah. I mean, the number one thing I, I think again is to try to see if you can get a read on the juries by having them remove their mask during selection and maybe even during, you know, while they're sitting six feet apart, during openings and closings, so you can get a better read on them. Um, that that's the one thing you know. I think very few judges are going to force jurors to do that because you obviously want them to be you know safe as possible, feel comfortable. But I think that's one thing that that um, would be very important. And I think the other thing that's going to be very important is be careful what type of case it is. If it's a case that really involves complexity, um, where you really need to be careful of the type of jurors or how the witnesses are perceived, um, it may be the type of case that you want to wait a little and not be one of the first. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I mean, most of the cases that, that I do are medical in one way or another. Uh, so that's obviously, that's a concern for me going forward 
you know, the, cause the, the testimony is more complicated. The issue, the proximate cause in particular issues uh, tend to be more complicated. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, all our cases are medical to one, you know, all our personal injury cases are medical in one form or another, whether it's a medical malpractice or nursing uh, negligence, or it's just a treating doctor in a personal injury case. However, the barrier I didn't have to deal with in this case, because it was strictly a auto case, was how healthcare providers are going to be perceived now in pandemic, post-pandemic. I mean, healthcare providers, nurses, doctors, they're our heroes now because they're the ones that have been out there um, taking care of us and, and, and going to work through all this and uh, preventing the illnesses from spreading and putting their families at risk. So if they weren't already considered heroes by many, now they certainly are. And as a plaintiff's lawyer, that's something I think is obviously concerning um, to make sure that you get a fair and unbiased trial. Oh, you're absolutely right. Because uh, if in jury selection, like I said, COVID didn't come up once. But if I was trying a, a medical malpractice or nursing home negligence case now, I don't know how you couldn't ask, you know, jurors about their perceptions of, of healthcare providers in light of COVID. Yeah, you might get two very, very different answers depending on if it's medical malpractice or a nursing home case. You could, <laughs> absolutely. But I think you need to know. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a brave new world. And Jordan, I want to thank you for, a for trying the case, showing us that, you know, there's, you can still get, you know, justice from a jury for your clients, even during these times. And, uh, you know, I, and this, I mean, to my knowledge, this is one of the first uh, civil cases that's been tried in the Chicago area. So, I mean, congratulations. Yeah, on that. I think, I think they've done a couple of what I've, what I've been told was this was the first 12 person in DuPage uh, civil trial. Um, I think they had done a couple of six persons before ours, and they had done a couple of bench trials. And I know there've been a couple of bench trials that were done by Zoom um, in Cook County, as well as a bench, I think a six person by Zoom in Lake County. I know I read about that, but I, I think they're starting back up and it, it can be done. If there's one thing I want to harp on people, it can be done. Don't be totally scared to do it, but just be careful about having the right case, making sure your client's on board. Um, those would be kind of the, the qualifications I would have and make you think about. Well, thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, if anyone wants to follow up with you or ask you some questions, pick your brain a little bit, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. Happy to, uh, to talk about it more. And if you have specifics, my, uh, just, I think the best way is to email me. My email is J Powell at Passen, P A S S E N Powell, P O W E L L.com. Jordan Powell. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And that concludes our interview with Jordan Powell. Again, I, I want to thank Jordan again for sharing his experience with us. I think there's a lot of things that we all can learn from contained within that interview. And, you know, it's it's good to hear that cases are being tried at the end of the day. You know, so I, that's it's a great thing. And uh, I want to thank Jordan again for sharing his experience with us. Uh, before we wrap up today, we want to give you our 30 second trial tip. One thing we do to make our cases stronger and our trials better. John, what's yours for this week? Go get on your feet and practice. We've been in a pause on jury trials for way too long. And now, as you heard, they're back. And that's great. We want to be able to get into a courtroom and hold people accountable for wrongdoing. But you have to sharpen your tools. And one of the easiest ways to do that, in my opinion, is to go speak with other people, whether it's over Zoom or over the phone or you're practicing in the mirror. We haven't had a lot of social interaction over the last year. We haven't been on our feet practicing cross, practicing direct, doing opening statements or practicing jury selection. All these things are things that need to be practiced over and over and over the same way you would take uh, you know, a thousand jump shots or a thousand free throws. You need to pick a jury in your head or for pretend a thousand times. And so now's a good opportunity as things begin to loosen and open back up and we can get together to get a small group of your friends together or a small group of lawyers that you trust and start working on things, workshop things, practice so that your skills are sharp when it's your turn to go pick a jury now that jury trials are back. No, that's an excellent point. Uh, Michael Cowan on his great 
uh, rival podcast. I want rivals an overstatement, <laughs> but uh, on this podcast talks about how, you know, the, the only, how crazy it was that when he was, would do community theater productions as a kid, they'd rehearse more for that than when he'd be putting on multi-million dollar cases. And uh, I couldn't agree more practice makes perfect. You know, we need to do it more. Uh, and, and that, that goes for everybody, no matter the experience level. Um, my tip for this week is chronology is not always the best way to tell a story. You know, it's important to have a chronology, but, and know the sequence of events, but when you're actually presenting it to a jury, that may not be the best or most interesting way to get your point across and to give the evidence to the jury. Um, the great attorney, Mark Mandel talked in his book, Case Framing, talks about this, about starting and staying with the best part of your case story. You know, sometimes that's, you know, if you have a huge crash, you know, showing, taking people back to that scene might be the best part of your story. Or if you have, you know, a devastating injury, taking them to, you know, the point where, you know, the person's trying to live their life, you know, in spite of all these limitations put on by their injuries, that may be the best part of your story. So make sure that you frame your case from the right perspective and, and understand it's okay to break free from chronology. You know, the sequence of events is important, but that's not necessarily how people remember things. And it's certainly not how people make their decisions. Absolutely. Think about some of your favorite movies and some of your favorite books and how the story is told. Sometimes they jump around. I heard Nick Rowley the other day discuss the Pulp Fiction opening statement where he'll jump from one scene to a totally different scene and back and forth and not in any sort of chronological order, but in the way that makes it the most compelling, sort of in the way that Tarantino does it, right? And um, I think that if you're married to the timeline, a lot of the storytelling can get lost exactly as you're talking about. So if you can keep people engaged, especially these days where everybody has a goldfish level of attention, um, you know, a Nats level of attention as uh, my colleagues say at the firm, uh, then you're going to be good. You just have to keep them engaged and tell a very good story. So you're absolutely right. And with that, that's going to be our episode for today. I want to thank Jordan Powell and for coming on and giving us his knowledge and experience. And remember, you can follow us and send us comments, questions, and episode ideas, or just troll us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at On Trial Podcast. You can also rate and leave us your feedback on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. And until next time, we'll see you on trial. <laughs>